Messenger! It's the big one! I know it! We'll all be destroyed! Calm down, Alpha! It's Rita! She's escaped and she's attacking the planet! Hi, yi yi What do we do? Teleport to us five overbearing and over-emotional humans! No! Not that! Not teenagers! That's correct, Alpha! I was afraid of that! Hey, thanks, Zordon! It's only the fate of the frickin' planet at stake! For that matter, are you supposed to be joking? Five overbearing and over-emotional humans? Yeah, those are traits that make for great superheroes. Has someone changed the water filter in your tube lately? Ladies and gentlemen and others, welcome to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. The series begins somewhere in space. The implication has always been that this is the moon, but as the show progresses, we'll learn that the moon is weird in the Power Rangers universe. There's a breathable atmosphere, for that matter, an atmosphere at all. The gravity is normal, and we're still landing on it. Now, in some circles, people debate about whether or not this isn't actually just some other planetoid near the Earth, but since future instances will refer to the villains being on the moon, we're going to call it as such. Anyway, two astronauts find what's referred to as a dumpster, hence the title of the first episode, Day of the Dumpster. That's something else I never got. That's not a dumpster, it's a bin or a barrel. Maybe you can get away with calling it a trash can, but most trash cans aren't made of stone or have jewels engraved in them. But anyway, the astronauts decide to not radio in that they found an alien object, but instead decide to open the quote-unquote dumpster, releasing Rita Repulsa and her band of freaks, her gorilla knight Goldar, her monster maker and scientist Finster, and the comic relief duo of Squad and Babu. Rita Repulsa is a sorceress often referred to as an empress of evil. Remember that point, since it'll be kind of important later. Anyway, she spent 10,000 years in the dumpster and now wishes to conquer the first planet she sees, Earth. As you saw before, Zordon, the big giant head, detects Rita's escape and decides to assemble a team of five teenagers to combat her. And let's meet those teenagers now. First is Jason, the Red Ranger, who teaches a karate class. Zack, the Black Ranger, is Jason's best friend and teaches what he refers to as hip-hop Aikido, basically combining breakdancing and fighting. Admittedly, that's kind of stupid in hindsight, but actually it does make for some impressive fighting moves, and hey, on my show I've got a ninja-style dancer, so who am I to judge? Next, there's Trini, the Yellow Ranger. Okay, you want me to comment on this, don't you? Yes, the Black Ranger is black and the Yellow Ranger is Asian. Let me get this out of the way. According to a panel at Power Morphicon in 2007 from one of the original creators, they honestly did not realize what they had done in casting until about the 10th episode. It was an honest, if horribly racist, mistake, and they rectified it in future casting. It should also be noted that in the original pilot, Trini was played by a different actress who wasn't Asian. Though ironically, Tommy, who would later become the Red Ranger, was a character with Native American roots. Whoops. Anyway, Trini is also a martial artist, but it's harder to get a gauge on her character. She's probably the least developed of the original team, though she does have her own unique fighting style. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that the actress who played her, Thuy Trang, tragically passed away in a car crash in 2001. Trini served the purpose of translating the techno babble of the next character, Billy. Billy is the stereotypical brainy nerd, yet if you see him without bulkier clothes, his physique is actually on par with the others on the show. Billy will be a mainstay of the show for the longest time, even after he stops being a Power Ranger. And finally, Kimberly. The second to last of the original five to leave the series, she is the stereotypical valley girl, a gymnast who loves them all, and etc, etc. Like Billy, because of how long she stayed on the show, her character will develop beyond the superficial qualities we see in the early days. However, it's also time to meet the real stars of the show. 
Bulk and Skull last through six seasons of Power Rangers and are the characters that have the most development over the course of it. What started as comic relief foils evolved into two characters who nobly stood up to evil. I love these two. They're like the Three Stooges of my generation. Yes, their comedy was often quite predictable, but they added some much-needed levity during some of the darker turns of the first few seasons. Come back, everyone! Let's get out of the building before it collapses! Oftentimes, their comedy subplots were actually more interesting than the plot of the episodes, and they remained some of the most popular characters on the show. Even if they began as bullies, though not particularly good ones since it was obvious that any one of the rangers was capable of kicking their asses, these are the two that went through the most change. Incidentally, it turns out that their first names are Farkas and Eugene. Yeah, I'd have gone by Bulk and Skull too. Let's face it, while there can be very good character moments and characterizations, the actual rangers tend to be a bit on the bland side. They're always trying to be goody goods, always talking about teamwork, friendship, the heart of the cards, blah blah blah. In a show that really liked having clear-cut heroes and villains, Bulk and Skull stood in a gray area for quite a while and their ultimate nobility served as a perfect capstone to their characters. While in the first season they served primarily as bullies, there were times when their better nature shined through. Two specific examples come to mind. The first is when they adopt a pig. Now, ultimately, the pig proved to be just a monster, and they were frightened of it when that happened, but they seem to actually be nice to it and want to take care of it after adopting it. The other is in the episode Crystal of Nightmares, where the two are put into a dream state. And what do they dream about? becoming superheroes and saving the world. Now, in the dream, they can't drive the Megazord properly, but I think the fact that they want to be good guys, even if they're selfish and inept, will help come into play in later seasons. But now back to the plot. Rita launches an attack on Earth, causing an earthquake to develop. As people jog lightly out of the juice bar in panic, the five teens suddenly decide to stay exactly where they are before being teleported away by Zordon. Zordon explains the plot of the show, that they have to fight Rita using morphers that will harness the power of ancient beasts like dinosaurs, the saber-toothed tiger, and the mastodon. Zordon in the early days, for some reason, was attempting to sport a British accent, possibly to make him sound more sophisticated. Hey, creators, he's a giant floating head in a tube. He's got our attention already. We also meet Alpha 5. Alpha can get pretty annoying with his constant proclamations of ay 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 but he's ultimately harmless and serves the purpose of being able to help do all the things Zordon can't do since, you know, giant floating head in a tube. The teens don't buy it, which I guess isn't that surprising, but come on, robot and giant head. I would think that'd be proof enough. After a fight with Rita's foot soldiers, the Putty Patrol, the group decides to try using their morphers for the first time and to become the Power Rangers. Since this is lifted from the Sentai footage, they're immediately teleported into a city to use that footage. They also get their Zords, the giant robots that, well, let's be honest, most of the time the individual Zords are pretty useless. The Red Ranger Zord usually gets the most screen time and also an alternate mode, while the rest basically just exist to be combined into the Megazord. Occasionally, the individual Zords will use their weapons, but not often. Usually it's call Zords, form Megazord, kick ass. As a first season, there were a lot of goofy ideas that were put in because they were still finding out their place and how they wanted the show to work. For example, in the second episode, we see this super duper martial arts move. Locked on! Go! Let's do it! <laughs> Suddenly puts that scene in Matrix Revolutions with Neo spinning on a stick in perspective. Elements seen in the first few episodes wouldn't really make any appearances later. For example, earlier on, Alpha had a teddy bear. Not sure what the hell the deal was with that. Later in the season, there was the introduction of something that could possibly have been the smartest damn thing they ever did. Jason David Frank as Tommy Oliver, the Green Ranger. Love him or hate him, this was the character that really cemented Power Rangers for the audience. In a five-part story, since this was in the days when new episodes of the series were shown on weekdays, called Green with Evil, Rita unveiled her plan to create her own evil Power Ranger, the Green Ranger. 
Where she got the power coin, I'll never understand, especially given what we learn later concerning the creation of the coins. Here's another thing that always confused me about the Green Ranger. They clearly had the suits used in the original Sentai, yet anytime we had new footage of him, they had this cloth gold shield instead of whatever the original was made out of. Why? It's not like it would have been that difficult to make a foam or plaster version of it to make it better match the Sentai footage. And for that matter, what happened to the one used in the original version? In any case, the Green Ranger was where things suddenly got interesting. For one thing, the fact that it was five parts long showed us that this was an epic like no other. No other kids' shows did five-parters at the time, and the guy was just badass. He wasn't some rubber-suited monster with a goofy gimmick. He was an actual human being who was able to outfight the group. He looked different, his weapon was different, and he had a zord that rivaled the others, rising from the ocean like a classic Japanese giant monster. He wrecked the command center, cut the rangers off from the guidance of Zordon, and even got into the Megazord to disable that as well. Ultimately, they broke the spell Rita had placed on him, and he officially joined the team. It's a really well-written and suspenseful story. They also started the first official romance with him and Kimberly, but I think I'll get into that more in the next segment. Besides for the introduction of Tommy and the Green Ranger and the romance, I'd say the Green with Evil miniseries also developed Jason and Billy. Jason, during a time in the saga, was forced to fight alone and without his ranger powers, and he was able to use his own skills to survive. For Billy, this put him on the path to better understanding the command center's technology as he assisted in repairing Alpha and their base of operations, which would lend a big hand in his future role on the team during Zeo. Over time, the show settled into its standard format of issue of the day, monster, zord fight, and finally tawdry resolution of the issue at the end. While they usually are pretty good about their own continuity, there's the occasional bizarre hiccup. For example, there's an episode called Life's a Masquerade, a rather enjoyable standalone episode featuring some great bits by Bulk and Skull, uh -huh. where Rita introduces her super putties, nearly indestructible versions of her old putties. The problem is that the episode right before it, Gung Ho, already introduced the Super Putties, and the group reacts with shock at the premise of the Super Putty both times. Do they have ADD or something? What the hell? Anyway, eventually the show ran into a bit of a problem. See, a lot of the fight scenes were dependent on the Sentai footage, and, well, there was only so much of it, particularly of the Green Ranger and the Dragon Zord. Now, they solved for the Green Ranger issue by writing him out of the show. In the two-parter, The Green Candle, Rita unveils a magic candle that, once fully melted, will return the Green Ranger powers to her. Why the hell she never unveiled this until now is a good question, but the point is that Tommy is going to lose his powers. Still, as evil plans go, this is certainly better than her usual rigmarole of trying to ruin the teenager's days by sending putties to cause minor inconveniences. Plus, as Spoonie himself has pointed out, using a candle to take over the world? That's pretty hardcore. The Rangers fought valiantly, and Jason himself tried to stop the candle, but ultimately failed. In order to prevent Rita from getting her hands on the Green Ranger powers, however, Tommy transfers them to Jason, granting him his shield and the Dragon Flute. Jason's failure to stop the Green Candle is something that would haunt him next season, but we'll get to that next time. Writing the Green Ranger out was a brilliant move from a marketing perspective. Tommy was a popular character, and instead of overexposing him, limiting his appearances meant that kids would be more inclined to tune in in the hopes of seeing him again, particularly on the episodes that he did come in for. Which brings us to Return of an Old Friend. Rita finally comes up with a plan that's not completely nonsensical and goofy, which is kidnap the teen's parents and ransom them for the power coins. They also take control of Billy's mind and force him to take the Dragon Dagger. This is the first time we actually see their parents, and, in true silly fashion, most of them dress like their kids, with Jason's parents wearing red and Skull's parents wearing punk attire. In fact, strangely enough, Bulk's parents seem the most normal. Goldar offers to return their parents in exchange for their power coins, and they give them up, but of course Goldar doesn't hold up his end of the bargain. However, Jason reveals that he still has the dragon coin. They recruit Tommy once again and infuse him with Zordon's own energy. However, they know it's only a temporary measure, and it's likely the powers could give out during a fight. 
After an intense fight, Tommy's able to retrieve the dagger and the power coins. And while he's now back as the Green Ranger, the group knows that the rejuvenation of his powers is only temporary. Besides for the running subplot of Tommy and Kimberly's relationship, there was also Zack's pursuit of Angela, who would brush him off any time he tried to impress her. It was actually a nice change to see that the teens weren't successful at everything they did, like it seemed to be. Though Angela's heart seemed to be won over whenever Zack did genuinely good things for her or when he bribed her. One particular aspect that occurred to me as I was watching the later episodes of the season was the change in fighting prowess. In the early episodes, the Rangers tended to fight off Putty successfully only after they'd morphed. Otherwise, they relied on tricks or misdirection in order to defeat them. In fact, Tommy's ability to fight off a squad of Putty single-handedly was an impressive feat to Rita. However, in a later episode, Zack was able to fight off a squad of putties himself, too. Billy's fighting ability in particular would change. In the beginning, he could barely fight off one putty, let alone a whole group of them, but by the end, he was able to hold his own in a fight beyond the stereotypical nature of his character. Mind you, some of this was simply narrative convenience, but it did hang in my mind as I was watching. Originally, the first season of Power Rangers was only supposed to be 40 episodes, ending on Doomsday. However, with the growing popularity of the series, they decided to keep it on, though Saban found itself needing new Sentai footage since they had run out of the footage produced by the original Zeo Ranger show. To solve the problem, they actually contacted the creators of the show to produce entirely new original footage that would only be used in Power Rangers. Damn! Just... Damn! It amazes me what kind of budget this show must have had. While dubbing a show is by no means a cheap process, it would have been considerably cheaper than continually producing original footage with all these characters having the new footage made by the original producers. And as we'll see, all new sets and villains made exclusively for this show. The underlying theme present is one of magic, or at least steampunk fantasy, versus technology. While both sides of the conflict utilize magic or technology, their methodology and surroundings are completely on opposite sides. Rita's palace is full of magic trinkets and its overall atmosphere is meant to evoke a wizard's lair. Her monster-making machine turns clay figures and pops them out as actual living beings. She has a magic wand to make her monsters grow, and she routinely uses magical items to achieve her goals, either calling upon some ancient spirit or, say, using the candle to take away superpowers. Even the monsters themselves tend to have a more mythological or mystical bent to them, or at the very least range on the fantastic. On the other side of the fence are the Power Rangers. The command center is a high-tech facility, and the Morphers themselves are an impressive feat of technology, accessing something called the Morphing Grid to give them their powers. While Zordon may have been described as a wizard before they fleshed out his backstory, he clearly prefers the use of technology that the group had at their disposal. Alpha himself is a robot, and the Rangers use giant machines to fight against Rita's magically created monsters. Billy is usually the tech go-to guy and also invents new devices to help the team out. Hell, his little brother even invents a virtual boy. Technology is presented as something extraordinarily necessary and useful to the team and the world at large. Mysticism and magic, while useful sometimes, are presented as tools of evil. What's interesting about this is that by the time we reach Zeo, that position will not only have swung more towards the mystical, but an outright reversal, with technological forces being the enemy, but we'll get to that when we get to it. All in all, the success of the show was probably not built on the most engaging of circumstances. While the acting is mixed in the early episodes, the characters do all eventually grow into a position where they're completely believable in their roles, as long as you ignore them preaching about community this and environmentalism that and teamwork and all that crap. Guest characters would be the worst actors since it comes off as not knowing if they should take their material seriously. Or, in some cases, they're just terrible actors. No, what I'd say really guaranteed the success was the action. No other show at the time was showing such complex fighting and choreography. And while the monsters were silly and the jokes were cheesy, there was something of a basic charm to the series that made people, especially kids, want to watch it. 
The growth of good storylines aided it, especially multi-parters where the stakes were high and you honestly weren't sure how they were going to resolve the situations. And while there were, of course, those times when logic broke through and you asked, Say, if Rita knows their identities, why doesn't she just blow up their houses? All in all, the first season was a good start to the show, even if 60 episodes was a bit much, especially when one considers that most of them followed the same damn formula. However, things would only go uphill in terms of storytelling in Season 2. Hey guys, I mean, you don't even know what you're talking about. We were talking to a giant floating head. 